The Bears continue to add big pieces through the transfer portal, but do they have their starting five for next year? We'll discuss on Locked on Baylor. You are Locked on Baylor, your daily podcast on the Baylor Bears. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, welcome to another week and welcome to another episode of Locked On Bay. We're brought to you by LinkedIn. I'm your host, Kim Stewart of ESPN Central Texas. Thank you for making it your first listen today and every day. Happy belated Mother's Day to all the mama bears out there. Appreciate y'all. I get to spend a nice day with my mom. It was very fun. Uh, today's episode, we are going to be going over some basketball because the Bears did get another commit in the transfer portal, and we're going to see how he fits into this system, what he brings to the table, and if that is the missing puzzle piece to the Bears starting five, because honestly, the answer might not be that simple. We're going to get down into the weeds about that too, and we got our first football power rankings of the year over the weekend, and it's not a pretty sight for Baylor. Now that said, are there enough question marks in this league for the Bears to sneak up on some people? We're going to discuss that as well. But starting first with the basketball news of the weekend, Jalen Celestine. That's how I'm going with it in terms of pronunciation because I've seen the name Celestino, but it could be Celestine. I don't know. Jalen Celestine of Cal, the Golden Bears switches to the green and golden bears commits to Baylor just on Friday night. So over the weekend, he gets that commitment and it's one that we had on our radar here in locked on Baylor. So we did a little bit of a breakdown on Thursday or Friday's episode, Thursday's episode, I think. Um, but what he brings is wing play first and foremost, and he brings some serious shooting to this Baylor squad. And what I will say before getting into kind of the stats about Celestine is He's a late bloomer, and I do not mean that in a bad way at all. In fact, it's going to help Baylor out a lot. I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by Celestine's career. He actually played at Long Island Lutheran, which is the same high school that VJ Edge comes coming out of, and he was an unranked prospect. Uh, he's a ca Canadian kid. He played, I think, his last year at Long Island Lutheran, maybe two. Um, unranked prospect, you know, um, it didn't average any more than 12 points a game in high school. So, you know, not lighting things up goes to Cal, which is not a basketball powerhouse by any means. And certainly hasn't been over the last couple of years. And you look at the numbers and just slowly, but surely, man, he just becomes a more and more complete player over his time at Cal faced a huge, faced some huge adversity with um, a knee injury that knocked him out of his junior season. So that was 2022, 23 missed the whole season and came back as a senior and played a bunch, man. Started 27 games and put up some pretty good numbers. Now, I know what you're saying because you're looking at the numbers and you're saying, well, can he average, what, eight points a game? Nine points a game? What, what, are, we, what are we talking about here? And I, I wanted to get that out of the way that he is a late bloomer because I expect even bigger numbers for him as a bear in Baylor, not a golden bear. In Cal, uh, I think he has the potential to to break out here in Waco. And the nice thing about him is, you might well get two years out of him. From what I've seen in my research, he, he I think he has two years of eligibility at his disposal with a medical red shirt in his junior year. Um, so technically, has already graduated from Cal. Usually, one year of eligibility, but I believe he has two. And so when you look at this. You're thinking, man, this guy gets better every year, and still, the, when you go deep into the numbers, you're like, this is a this is a talent here. He's a kid that's 6'7", 6'8", 215 pounds is what he's listed as, and you see, you see his highlights, man. He's a truck. He, he's a big kid um, in in a, in a very good way. Again, not a great Cal team, but had the highest offensive rating on the entire team at 118. So when he's on the floor for 100 possessions, the team's going to score 118 points. That's that's a big number. That's a pretty darn good number. Um, and so he comes with that, even though he doesn't take a lot of shots in a game or doesn't put up the biggest amount of points. Now, you see that efficiency, and that obviously helps with the offensive rating, with his three-point shooting. He shot 44% from three last year. 
I was second in the in the entire Pac-12. And you know, that that's kind of the good with it. The I guess bad with it is he never made more than four in a game. So you're like, well, can this kid really shoot Cam? Does he have the confidence? I'm telling you, when he is the third or fourth option on a team and he's shooting 44% from three, he's going to have more open looks this year for Baylor. He's going to probably take more threes. And even if he's not, that's a heck of an efficiency. That is that is what we saw from Jalen Bridges his first year at Baylor, which, you know, I, I remember it was he was scrutinized at first, and then you got kind of in a February of that first year, and he became a different player, became a dangerous offensive player for the Bears. Uh, Celestine is on that track. I don't know if he's going to pull out, you know, the, the season that Jalen Bridges had, certainly this past year, but he 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 is capable shot wise of what Jalen Bridges is capable of. And he's certainly on that same trajectory. And one thing that did stick out to me, I think of guys like uh, Jalen Bridges, certainly this year and Adam Flagler in his all American year, when it comes to this stat, um, Celestine is in the 99th percentile in the country in effective field goal percentage, 72%. Boy, I love me some advanced stats, and that is a mouthwatering one. Okay, when, when when this kid is open, he doesn't miss. 99th percentile out of that. I just, I love that. Um, in fact, his most effective shot, which I got through these, uh, these college basketball scouting YouTube videos, which are so, so helpful. His most effective shot is the corner three. 56% from the left corner, 44% from the right corner. Didn't shoot them a lot. Didn't shoot them a lot, but that is his most effective shot. Again, I'll bring up Jalen Bridges because this is the guy he's kind of replacing here. Yeah, corner threes were open for him for both years. The way Baylor spaces out the floor and how great their guards are going to be this year, this kid could be living in the corner. And if that's true, that is a big benefit for the Bears. Absolutely love that. Um and he is a guy who can finish at the rim. He shoots 60% at the rim. He's not shooting it that much there in the paint. You know, only a quarter of his shots are coming there. But an effective guy, and at his size and, you know, tall and also strength, like that could be very effective for the Bears um, to have someone who can finish amongst the trees in a very physical Big 12 conference because that is something that has been kind of hit or miss for the Bears I would say the last two years is inside scoring. Um, you got you got good good doses of it from Eve Misi this past year, um, but the only maybe the only downside of Eve Misi was he could only play about 25, 26 minutes a game. So you know he, he was not bad at that, but now you get a guy who could potentially play out there more and finish inside, and you got a guy like Norchad O'Meara who can finish inside. We're going to talk a little bit about them in this in the second segment here, but. Celestine, I'm not saying he's coming in. He's going to be a Big 12 guy, big all Big 12 guy. I don't know that. But he's a kid who comes in with a ton of potential, who's already played at a Power 5 level and been effective at a Power 5 level. Uh, that Again, a lot of that, those intangible things, scream J1 Bridges to me. And if this kid can come in and have a year or a two-year stretch close to what J1 Bridges gave you, with the rest of the players around him. Again, Bridges had to be the best offensive player, basically, for the Bears down the stretch this year and down the stretch last year. Um, If you have a guy who can put that kind of efficiency and be the third or fourth scoring option, the Bears, they they are very much in good shape when it comes to that. And that, I think, is what you are getting with with a guy like Jalen Celestine. Well, what you are getting from a place like LinkedIn is the absolute best place to go to your hires. If you're hiring people or you are looking for a job, there is nothing better than LinkedIn Talent Solutions. It's not like any other job board that helps you hire professionals that you can't find anywhere else, even those who aren't actively searching for a new job, okay? Mark Pope was not looking for the Kentucky job, but the Kentucky job found him, and I think it's a good hire. And in a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't visit any other leading job sites. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you are looking in the wrong place, brother. On LinkedIn, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. You hire professionals 
like a professional. They know that small businesses are wearing a ton of different hats. They might not have the time or the resources to hire. And that's why LinkedIn is constantly finding new ways to make that process easier. Two and a half million small businesses use LinkedIn for hiring. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That is linkedin.com slash locked on college, locked on C-O-L-L-E-G-E to post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. And so looking at kind of how this fits in at all of them, you know, we, we, we love adding these guys in the transfer portal, but make no mistake about it. This, this is a big project for this Baylor team to replace four of their five starters, four of their top five scorers from last year's team. And, you know, your top three, I would say, assistant coaches. That is a lot. So you bring in talent, absolutely. But I think what Baylor has done um, very meticulously is not just brought in talent. They have brought in great fits for what they need both on the court and certainly from what we've seen from an intangible standpoint off the court as well. You know, Jeremy Roach bring, brings a leadership and a final four experience with him. Nor Chad O'Meara brings a final four experience with him. When a guy who wants to be a leader, bringing in some grit and some great rebounding as well. And Jalen Celestine brings in a lot of the things that Jalen Bridges was bringing with him from his first year at West Virginia. Probably not as touted as someone like Jalen Bridges was because we got to see him a lot in the Big 12, but brings a lot of the same thing. So how does this fit together? Does Baylor have their starting five right now as we talk on May the 13th? I don't know. I don't know. Probably. But the thing, the thing is, is Baylor does have another spot or two that they can fill. Um, I, I don't know if that's coming from, you know, a power five level, if it's coming from a, uh, from a junior college level, I don't know, but there are spots that are going to be filled there. Maybe it's a walk on who's coming on that we don't know about yet and doesn't see a lot of the court, but they have some options on where to go with, with those couple of spots left. So I, I don't know, of course we'll be keeping track of it. Um, but I wonder if Jalen Celestine is is one who just slots right in as a starter the way Jalen Bridges did. And honestly, it depends on how Baylor's going to split up this starting five. And I am I'm amazed to see how they're going to do this because right now, you could see, I, I, I could put a starting five out there of three guards, okay? And that, that would be Roach, um, Vijay Edgecombe, and a Langston Love who's a more physical guard who can play in the post a little bit. You know, I'm not saying he's posting guys up necessarily, but he could post up a defender of the same size, maybe even a little bit bigger and can guard guys who are a little bit bigger than him. So you could th see a three guard set with, with those three. And then you would have Joshua Jamuna, I think in North Chad Omir. And that to me is the starting five. I would go with right now. Um, but that said, if you were like, hey, we love what Langston Love gives us off the bench. We love that we can rotate, you know, a backcourt bench of of guys like Langston Love and Jaden Nunn and and um and Robert Wright, then okay, then we go with a, a true front court. And then you probably do see Jalen Celestine in that starting lineup. Or or you could still see Jason Asimoda in that starting lineup. I doubt it, but it could be. I did that whole episode Friday with Nick Weaver from Hillcrest Prep, and I, I know he comes from a biased source, but I love the things he was saying about Jason Asimoda. And, and looking at the tape and, and seeing what other people are how other people are talking about Asimoda, I think there is something to the fact that he is an underrated prospect. Um, but I, I he is a guy, and I think Rob Wright is another guy who are we're going to stay more than one year. And so I don't know that Asimoda is going to be able to start on this team and, and have two, maybe three, outside chance of three um, freshman starters. But I, I, I could see a world where he and Celestine are platooning their minutes um, if Asimoda is, is truly ready for this Big 12 schedule. I could see them splitting those minutes. And so at that point, it's like, okay, well, it's a coin flip of who's going to start, at least in the non-conference. Um, so there, there's already a couple different ways they can go, and they might not have even added their fifth starter yet. 
they might not have. Now, one thing I think, well, a couple of things I think needs to change from this team is first off, the defense overall has just got to get back. Um, it has taken a dip since they, they were winning Big 12 championships in 21 and 22. And that is that cannot be overstated that the defense needs to get better. It was, I thought, not very good at all in 22, 23, and it was better last year. Um, but now you got to take that next step with again different personnel. And it just hasn't been that lockdown defense that you come to expect from a top end Big 12 team since 2022. And so that that needs to be the first thing. But the other thing is, and this is no secret, the, the key to Baylor getting extra possessions is offensive rebounding. Okay. So 21, 2021, the national championship team, they were not a top 10 defense. They looked that way because their best defense was a good offense. They had the ball so much because they were an elite offensive rebounding team. And, you know, 22 was a much better defensive team. Uh, they were suffocating teams. Now, offensive rebounding, though, is the key number. Uh, they were second in the conference in 2021 and second in the conference in 2022. Both years, they won the conference in the regular season. Last year, they were ninth. And we were like, this is a this is a better rebounding team than 2023. They were. Even Misi was a good rebounder. Joshua John when it was an effective rebounder. Jalen Bridges was an okay rebounder. He's actually the team's leader in rebounds. Um, but it was it, it didn't at any point feel like this is an elite rebounding team because those are the teams you see in the final four. That is what needs to get better. Uh, and you look at the size on the team and you're like, eh, does this team have it? I think this is the closest you have had to Mark Vidal and Flo Thamba since Mark Vidal and Flo Thamba playing alongside each other. So I think Josh O is actually a better rebounder than Flo Thamba, and you have him next to an elite rebounder in Norchad O'Meara, a guy who's averaging double-digit rebounds in the ACC a year ago, a guy who, again, led his conference in rebounding percentage all four years he's played. <laughs> college basketball. So that, that to me is the big one um, because that the defense falls into place after that. It, it wasn't, it wasn't an issue of not enough effort on the defensive end last year. Trust me, it wasn't, but I don't think they loved a lot of the matchups that they had. And I don't think, you know, they had enough offensive rebounding to, to cover up those holes this year. I think they do offensive rebounding wise. That is the key stat to me. Whenever you look at the teams in the final four, they are elite offensive rebounding teams. They're elite second chance points teams and they're elite points off turnover teams. And Baylor struggled with that last year. Again, ninth in offensive rebounding. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I, I was saying it on all these post games that they, they got out second chance and they got out points off turnovers. <laughs> if that makes sense. They frequently got beat up in that department of points off turnovers. And so this year you have, I think, what could be two elite point guards. So you're not turning the ball over as much. Hopefully, fingers crossed, knock on wood. And if you could figure out that offensive rebounding, which I think they have the personnel to do, not deep at those positions, not deep. So I think that is something else to remember for roster construction. They still don't have enough centers. Um but I think they can make up that offensive rebounding. So things to look out for. They still need another center. I think you start Ojamuna and Omir, and that's great. But if one of them gets hurt, you are looking down the barrel, you know, of playing a lot of small ball in the case of, you know, if Ojamuna gets hurt, but if Omir gets hurt, then you are taking a huge dip in quality out of your of your rebounding. So those are the things that I need to see in order to say this is Baylor's team next year. This is Baylor's starting five. Do they have it? Do they have a starting five right now? Potentially, but I don't know that that they have a full roster right now, which is the next thing for, for me and for you, the fan, for us to look out for in terms of finalizing this roster. 
Today's episode of Locked On Baylor is brought to you by FanDuel. We have got the playoffs going on, and there are so many ways to make this even more interesting. Winner take all for the NBA and the NHL, and FanDuel is giving you a shot to bring home a big win of your own. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 bucks to bet on spreads, money lines, player props, so much more. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make every playoff shot count that's fanduel.com slash locked on l-o-c-k-e-d-o-n fanduel america's number one sports book switch gears over to football we're worried about what this basketball roster is going to look like and what their preseason ranking is going to be like on the hardwood well football we got our first big 12 way too early power ranking of the year but is it too early we're done with spring football maybe it's not but our first Big 12 Power Ranking of the Year through CBS Sports and through Shian J. Araja, Baylor alum who does really an excellent job of covering all these teams in the Big 12. And we're going to get more into this in the next couple of weeks. But this is a fascinating year of Big 12 football to me. And, and Shian actually lays it out in the second paragraph of this. As many as 10 teams have a legitimate shot to make the conference title game. The parity in this conference has been incredible um, since they re I th since they redid the, the Big 12 championship game. I don't think we've had the same two teams in their back-to-back -back years. You know, we saw a lot of Oklahoma victories, don't get me wrong, um, but we are seeing new challengers every single year and with OU out of the conference and having not been in that game in the last couple of years, we are going to see some more of that, I would say. And so now we got 16 teams in the Big 12 and we got to rank 16 of them. Baylor, your Baylor Bears, come in 12. Which, if you're splitting this into groups of four, that leaves them just on the outside of the bottom tier, the bottom four of this Big 12 conference. Directly ahead of them, a couple of uh, conference rivals, or in-state rivals, I should say. Tech at 9th, TCU at 10th. Just ahead of them at 11, Colorado Buffaloes. We're going to talk about them in a minute. And behind them, BYU, Cincinnati, Houston, and Arizona State. And by the way, for if you're looking into this, uh, it is on CBSSports.com. Shion is Utah, number one. Kansas State and Kansas following them. So Baylor sits at 12. And I, he does a little write-up for all of these, and I'll just read it. Word for word, why not? Baylor hasn't spe spent much time in the cellar, but a 3-9 and nine campaign was the worst by a returning coach since 2007. Instead of making a change, Baylor's athletic department is making a costly gamble that Dave Aranda can right the ship for a second time in four years. Reasons for optimism, they nabbed offensive coordinator Jake Spavadol and running backs coach Keenan Hall from ACC schools, which is true. Cal and SMU are now both ACC schools to transition towards the spread offense. And they took a big swing by added Mac player of the year, QB Dequan Finn from Toledo. Anything short of a bowl game in Aranda is likely out, but is Baylor up for the challenge? I think so. But I think more so than just looking at Baylor here is looking at the rest of the conference. Like I look up and down this conference and all I see are question marks, right? Like I talk about the teams ahead of UCF at eighth. I, I don't know what's coming in there. I like KJ Jefferson. Don't get me wrong, but like, I don't know what that is. Tech, I, I would actually think would be a little bit higher. I think they're going to have that stability under Joey McGuire and, and the expectations that we all had for them last year, I think are better suited for this year. TCU at 10, I, uh, five and seven, two of the last three seasons with a miracle season mixed in between there. Um, I, I do like Josh Hoover. Uh, I don't think he's like a, a guy that leads you to a conference championship game, and and he was hurt in spring ball. You know, uh, do you have to go to a, a Haas Haney out of Alito uh, as, a, as a freshman, a true freshman? Is that the next guy up if Hoover is hurt or gets hurt at some point in the season? Don't know. BYU, really don't know. Really don't know. I, I love Gary just as much as you, um, and and I would love to see him lead them to success. But I just don't know with that team. I, I thought they were going to be a better team last year than they were. And then Cincinnati, Houston, Arizona State, like that's bad. That's that's bad. Those are bad teams. Um, they were beat one of them last year and should have beat a second one. Uh, Colorado is is one that interests me. Right ranked right above them. Um, in fact, if you look at Colorado last year, 
they weren't that much different from Baylor. They they were bad. They were four and eight. They finished last in the Pac-12. Um, they obviously had a more dynamic quarterback in Shooter Sanders. Travis Hunter is probably the best corner in the country, but they had a dreadful offensive line, just horrible and horrible running game. They were, I think, the worst rushing team in the Pac-12. They they, they could not run for man. They they stunk, and they they brought in some new running backs. Of course, they brought in a whole new offensive line. But it's like we we talk about this with Baylor offensive line. You know, I think chemistry can be overblown in some position groups, not at offensive line. You need those guys playing together and you need units playing together. And they don't have that luxury. Neither does Baylor of having these guys having played together for 10 or 12 games going into the season. They don't have that. So I think Colorado and and Baylor could be too, are like teetering on dumpster fire. Um, And, That's the thing. A lot needs to go right for Baylor to climb into that top half of the Big 12. But when you look at a team like Colorado and TCU and and UCF ahead of them, like things could go wrong for them. I think things could go wrong with Arizona without Jed Fish. I like Iowa State, who's ranked sixth. I think they're going to finish higher than that. Um, But like these are, there are combustible teams ahead of them. So should Baylor be in that second to worst tier to start in, in our first preseason rankings, power rankings of the Big 12? Yes, they should. You can make an argument they could be in the worst tier. I think we're under no illusion that this is a team that like we're saying, no, they should be top four. But what I'm saying is there are combustible teams ahead of them. So these rankings will change. I'm sure, um, especially once we get close to the season in August, I think we'll start to see more and more, and it will be probably the most diverse power rankings of any conference in the country here in the Big 12. Um, But I think you will see in these bottom tiers, Baylor, at least in the second to bottom, maybe the bottom of these tiers. I think they can prove a lot of people wrong, but a lot of that has to do with how combustible the teams are ahead of them. Anyway, let me know what you think about that 12th out of 16. Drop that down in the comments below what you think they should be ranked and if they nailed it or if this team's going to win the whole damn thing. Let me know down in the comments below. Let me know what you think about this, how this roster is coming together on the basketball side. I like it. I still think there's work to be done, but the top end talent of this team is as good as anybody in the big 12. It really is. It's just those pieces of, of getting the final puzzle pieces together to have them actually be a like the top team in the Big 12 because right now there are a couple teams ahead of them, I would say, but that's nothing to nothing to sneeze at. I still think they could be a top five team. So drop that down in the comments below what you think about this Jalen Celestine edition. Drop that in there too. Be sure to like and subscribe. Ring the notification bell. We'll drop that video to you every day on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And thank you for making it your first listen today and every day. We'll be back tomorrow with more Lock on Baylor.